Hey everyone, Zach from the Known Unknown here. Uh, before we get into Cyril's story, I just wanted to cover a couple of things. First of all, uh, if you enjoy this video or anything like that, I'm just going to get this out of the way now. Uh, obviously, like the video, subscribe, show all your friends. Uh, I'm not going to break up the story with doing all those plugs and stuff, so I'm going to do it now. Um, secondly, this episode is going to be part of a three-episode um, mini arc it was a one shot that me and my friend Shane ran so expect a new episode every week for three weeks with that being said This is the first episode So there is a decent amount of exposition in the beginning So if you're really not big into like world building or exposition that is totally fine Just know that when the action starts in this episode It doesn't stop until the end of the one shot the last thing I wanted to say here is a, a content warning this one shot takes place in a world in which the mortals rose up against the gods and waged a war uh, that was a hundred years ago, and now everyone who is living in the world is kind of dealing with the repercussions of that war. It is now this place where monsters roam free, a place where the celestial heavens are cut off from the rest of the world. With that being said, this is a horror one-shot, so um, expect some vulgarity, expect some body horror, expect some very scary, uh, gory scenes to happen. And the last thing I want to say is there is an off-scene reference to human sacrifice that is kind of dark. So, without me wasting any more time... It is time to jump into the city of Gravenroy, and it is time to hear the story of Cyril. Enjoy, everyone. Welcome to the world of Odyssea, a world once filled with bountiful seas, expansive forests filled with creatures of wonder, a wonder you would struggle to even imagine, and kingdoms that ruled entire continents. A world once full of magic that brought hope. But that is all in the past. Everything changed when the mortals of this world waged their just war against my kind. And they won. But their celebrations were quick. Both sides suffered large amounts of losses and the war took its toll not only on those who fought, but on the world of Odyssea itself. Once beautiful seas now sit corrupted by the rotting corpses of gods forgotten, the forests filled with beasts from the worlds below, and the once great kingdoms nothing more than crumbling ruins. But tonight our story is a much smaller one than a war between mortals and their gods but it is not any less significant, because in chaos is all possibilities. Our story starts in the coastal city of Gravenroy, a once prosperous port city, now a place of refuge for those trying to survive against the outside world. We join our main character not at the beginning of his story, but instead at the end of a chapter. His life full of mysterious tragedies only rivaled by his unrelenting drive to make sense of it all. Just earlier today, he got the final piece of the puzzle, a rare glimpse at that bigger picture, a mystery that he has been obsessing over for a majority of his life. The puzzle piece, a medallion found on the body of a corpse recovered from the harbor, a symbol that he faintly remembers from his childhood. Continuing on his quest for answers, he now stands before a tavern constructed with rotting lumber and rusting sheet metal. Above the door, a patchwork sign reading the fishmonger. Inside this tavern, a creature who has the answers he is looking for. So, Shane, it is time to play some D&D. Um, we are currently in the city of Gravenroy, this city that is kind of has this Victorian feel. It is 120 years after the war with the gods, and this, like I said, this once beautiful city that was, was pretty much an exporting city of fish and all that kind of stuff has pretty much reverted into almost like a prison-like place uh, where the walls not only keep out the monsters, around them, but also the evil that happens within the city. 
Um, we are going to currently join your character, Cyril, as they stand under a lamplight. Because, you know, we're doing a whole noir murder mystery type deal. It has to be all, like, it, it, it's, you guys will see. Um, uh, but go ahead and uh, describe your character before we jump into this. All right. I stand under the glowing light of a street lamp. Uh, Cyril's a gruff, middle-aged human. He's got a five o'clock shadow with his hair pushed kind of, like, back and to the side. He almost always looks wet, probably because he's working hard or because he lives in a coastal city where it rains all the time. A little bit of both. Um, <laughs> draped across his shoulders is a, a, a long black duster, and he wears an old beat-up fedora. It still looks nice, but it, it looks old. Um, beneath the duster is an off-white dress shirt and plain black slacks. Dress shoes and an untied tie. A gun holster with a pistol. All of his clothes appear worn and weathered as he stands, dripping in the rain, with a cigarette in his mouth. Hell Hopefully yeah! It's actually raining. Uh, it, it's, it, it is raining. <laughs> you actually nailed it perfectly. Right now, if this was a film, you'd slowly hear like a really slow jazz soundtrack slowly coming in. There'd be a Rorschach's journal. <laughs> um. All right. Awesome. So let's uh, let's get this thing started. So. Um, as you stand under this lamplight, as it begins to rain, that was actually in my notes before you even said that, uh, you can hear thunder coming from far out in the deep. The deep being the once Artemisian sea now kind of turned into just general badness uh, because there is a rotting, a rotting, a, there is a rotting corpse of a god in it. Uh, so it has become the deep, this black, inky sea that really you don't want to mess with. Um, down the road, uh, you hear some people yelling. Uh, this isn't super surprising in Gravenroy, especially at this hour. It's just a little bit after dusk. Um, uh, many people on this small island, uh, one of the islands that make up the lower city of Gravenroy, um, many of the people here work in the factories, in the warpweed factories, the refineries, pretty much. Um, warpweed being this, like, way that people get uh, the essence of the dying god and turn it into arcane oil is the best way I can describe it. And yeah, you hear yelling out in the distance. Um, people have been off and on going down the street uh, for the last couple minutes. And yeah, you stand here in your hand. You have a symbol that um, was just that you found out just today. This symbol that is a triangle with tentacles outreaching. Um, like, and then there's a circle. So it goes triangle, tentacles outreaching, then a circle and those tentacles overlap the circle. It's almost like a sun, but instead of a sun, it is this strange, aberrant creature reaching out in all directions. Um, and yeah, you are currently standing in front of the fishmonger. What do you do? Uh, is he open for business? It is currently open. You see um, the rotting uh, wood and the like. The sheet metal um, along it has like a window, probably a really grimy window. I mean, it is a coastal city, so it's probably full of like sea salt and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you see, like, very obscured inside um, some lamps lit. You see there's someone behind a bar. There's a couple tables that are filled. And you see some booths uh, that are also occupied in it. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, prime drinking hours. So the fishmonger is likely a, is a, is a bar. It is a tavern, yes. <laughs> the best place to seek answers. Got it. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, I'm just going to go in like I've been here a million times. And, uh head up to the to the bar I guess unless I know who I'm looking for specifically um you do know who you are searching for so you are searching for the creature named Morson um they you know that Morson is this fey like being that has a deep knowledge of the cult and symbols in the city um and you've probably because you are a seasoned investigator especially in Gravenroy uh, you've probably turned to Morrison in the past to get information so um you do know that you are meeting them here and you also know that whenever you meet Morrison it is an experience to say the least excellent do I see him as soon as I come in or is he uh yeah so you enter the fishmonger um the door creaks open uh, there's a little bell um above it rings uh, you are immediately hit with a strong scent of I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your life, but I've not. So if anyone's out there who has, um, you smell um, like brine, so kind of like pickled stuff, vinegar. Um, 
but mixed with deep eel. <laughs> So oh. it's this really, like, gross, very strong, pungent smell that immediately hits your nostrils. Um, and it's also kind of mixed with this uh, smell of just sea salt and mildew. Um, the layout is simple. Like I said, on the left, there is a makeshift bar with barrels of al stacked behind it. Um, you see an old dwarven man whose skin has wrinkled from the sun and uh, whose beard is white and looks coarse from the sea salt in this area. Um, he currently has one of the kegs open and he has like this large paddle that he's currently stirring around and you're guessing like that's whatever brined eel or whatever they have here he's currently working on. Um, in the center of the tavern you see three lopsided tables in which two of the tables are occupied uh, with what seems to be uh, workers from the local warpweed refinery. You think of like overalls, okay. like uh, leather jackets and all that kind of stuff. You see their hands have been, are, are purple and uh, warped a little bit. Their veins are sticking out. Uh, that's from working with the warpweed, this really corruptive uh, substance for a very long time. And uh, on the right side of the tavern, you see some makeshift booths. And uh, because we're doing D&D, &D, there has to be someone in the corner booth. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be the person you're looking for. So in one of those booths, you look to uh, what you see, what looks to be a man with a mixture of flesh and bark. So think like, I'm trying to think of like a good reference here. Um, it kind of looks like a tiefling. Like he kind of looks like a tiefling, but if you remove the like red leathery flesh or blue leathery flesh and the horns, uh, you replace that with a very dark bark. Um, kind of scattered around him. You see his eyes are sunken up, sunken in, not up, sunken into his uh, face, and he has dingy green, and I should say they're dingy green, um, and they resemble moss, and he doesn't have any pupils or anything. It's just like a solid green. Um, and uh, from protruding from his forehead, two very large wooden antlers. Uh, behind those antlers, wispy strands of white hair. He, It's like this strange mixture of man, but also fey, and you're kind of... It's like they, like this being, whatever it was, has kind of succumbed to the corruption of nature magic or to phase something. Um, he also wears a patchwork leather jacket made from a handful of different beasts. Morrison looks over at you and smiles. Uh, when he smiles, you see that his teeth are very sharp um, and some of them look like they're made out of rocks themselves. Um, yeah, what do you do? Excellent. Uh, I don't smile because I'm always brooding. Um, as you should. <laughs> and as I walk up to the table, I'll just take my hat off and kind of set it down and, and sit with him. I assume he knows why I'm here. Does he not? You, um, he knows. He knows. He, like, you've, you've contacted him. He knows, like, all right, if Cyril's contacting me, then he's probably going to need information on any, on something. Um, so as you sit down, you put your hat on the table. Um, you hear the door chime um, a couple more times as more people come in from the street. Uh, like I said, it's like the prime drinking tavern hours here in the city. Mm -hmm. um, as he, as you sit down, he um, keeps his like big teethy grin, um, like open, looking at you. <laughs> um, and he will say, and when he speaks, it sounds like he is speaking half through vocal cords, half through, um, like, bark. Kind of like Treebeard from the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, okay. He will say, um, Cyril, I'm guessing if you've searched me out, you would like to make a deal. You need something from me. What? Is it? I need a lead. Tell me what you know about this. And I'm just gonna lift my hat off the table and under it'll just be the the medallion that I have with the symbol on it. Yeah, the like symbol? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> yeah, you place that on the table, um and he picks it up uh, with his hands. He moves kind of very Almost, I want to say like robotic, but it's because he's made out of bark, so he kind of has, he's in not as fluid motion as someone who is made out of all flesh and picks it up and looks at it. Um, and he'll say, I, I know what this is. Something long and forgotten. But you know the deal. If you want information, I want a memory. I want to know 
what it feels like to feel fear. What does it feel like to be scared, Cyril? <clears throat> like nothing you've ever experienced before, and nothing you'd ever want to experience again. Try. You find, you find yourself frozen in place, like a painting out of time, and your stomach will sink, and your heart will pound through your chest, and your throat will close up, and you won't be able to move. And then it'll just stop. That's all fine and dandy, but those are just words. I want a memory. Tell me of a time you were scared. Tell me the last time you felt fear. When I Putting was a lad. Spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was gonna read my backstory. <laughs> Well, you see, I was a <laughs> child. So, when I was but a boy, the tender age of 13. Yeah, and as you begin speaking, uh, you begin to notice that um, the words coming out of your mouth aren't just sound. Um, as you notice, like, a silver mist begin to go out as you speak, and you can see that uh, Morrison is doing this somehow as he's pulling this memory from you as you speak it. Oh gosh. Am I gonna lose this memory? No, you've worked with Morrison before. Okay. Also, that would be very bad if you just gave away your backstory and you're like, huh, why, what am I supposed to be doing again? Why am I here? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> but no. Um, so yeah, on her 13th birthday, my, my mother, the not my, not my mother's 13th birthday. <laughs> On my sister's 13th birthday, my mother, an experienced and talented baker, wanted to make her a special cake. So my sister and I volunteered, of course, the great children that we were, to go to the market and uh, get her some, some starter yeast because we were out. And uh, my sister hadn't spent much time in the city. And uh, somehow we had become separated and... That's that's when fear starts, right? Your your heart starts to race, your throat starts to close up, and then I moved through the crowd and I was uh, searching frantically for her. And when I broke through the edge of the crowd, I saw her, hands out, palms ahead of her, uh, walking down a dock headed towards the sea. And that's when like true fear sets in. Um, when you really freeze up and feel like you can't do anything in the final moments of of a person that you love as she just walks off of a dock. Um, and I'll, as you're I'll saying, take my lead now, please. <laughs> yeah, as you're <laughs> saying that, uh, uh, Morrison just never breaks eye contact. Um, doesn't actually blink that much. He just looks at you and as you're speaking he sees that silver mist and when you're done he inhales and you watch it go through his nostrils and you can see like the, the bark on him and like the very plant like tree like parts of him like begin to crackle and he stretches cracking more um and at the same time this is happening you begin to hear uh, as more people have entered the tavern that there is starting to be like a commotion and not just like it could just you don't know if it's just like some people who've drank a little bit too much who are getting rowdy but uh you do hear the bartender is like somewhat like yelling at um a new person who has entered to sit down because it seems like they're causing chaos but you as the, this is the same time that morrison's doing a really strange like absorbing a memory so it's like okay um <sighs> I, I, I don't what care oh. for fear that much hmm yeah, and that's why that's my last memory of fear. I gave that shit up a long time ago. What did you replace it with? Anger. Now that is an emotion I am familiar with. You want to lead, right? Please. This isn't the first time that this symbol has popped up in this city, or 
in Odyssea. It is the symbol of a creature which once had a name, but that name is much older than me and you and most living things. Your kind calls this creature, this demon, the everlasting hunger. A being who only knows one thing, and that is to devour. The everlasting hunger fed very well during the war. But since the war ended and the celestial realms closed, it seemed to disappear. Like I said, this isn't the first time the symbol has appeared in the city. And lucky for you, the place that once appeared is not too far from here. At the southern end of this island, a couple blocks away, you will find a manor. The Linville Manor, to be precise. A building from when the city wasn't in disrepair. There you will find what you are looking for. Uh, when was the last time that this symbol was spotted in the city? Well, I'm guessing you pulled that from today. Um, that's not the first time the symbol has appeared within this week. It's actually probably the fifth. Oh. There's been bodies popping up with that symbol, either etched into their skin or with a medallion like you have. Hmm. And who is in the manor now? Uh, as you are saying that, uh, you are starting to hear the commotion at the bar become more and more hectic as, like, people are now genuinely yelling at each other. Um, and you hear, like, a ta like a chair get, like, thrown backwards and collide into the ground. Um, what do you do when that happens? Do you keep up the conversation, or do you check what's going on out? Does, does Morrison care? Morrison is just locked eyes with you. If he's uninterested, then I'm uninterested. Like, I, all right. Not to mention, like, I'm not here for that unless it has something to do with what I'm looking for. Fair enough. Do they? Are they? Okay, I'll turn my head for a moment. Are they looking at us? Like they're like something's gonna hit us? No, no, no. So you, uh, you look over your uh, shoulder as trying to like figure out what, well, like, what is this commotion? Um, at first it sounded like maybe it was just like some drunk, uh, drunk people, um, yelling at each other or not. But you see. Um, what is happening now? You see this person who looks a little, um, worse for weather. And that's saying a lot for this part of the town. Like, there's a lot of people who have been, um, manipulated into some pretty shitty circumstances in the lower cities. Um, but this person genuinely doesn't look well. Their skin is... <sighs> become pale. Very pale pale almost unnaturally pale and they're starting to like their skin is also seems to be crawling uh, like their veins are moving around inside and you see this person standing currently at the the tab like at the um, bar with both hands on the bar and you see across from him uh the dwarven bartender who's yelling at him uh because you can see that this person uh, this sickly person has just knocked over the bar stool, and it looks like they're about to, like, throw up or something. And you can see that the bartender is like, Get out! Uh, yelling at him. Hmm. Rough night. Anyway, who lives in the manor now? Who Who's currently occupying this manor? 
<laughs> yeah, um, uh, Morrison, who, like, you turn around and it's, like, almost, like, this thing where Morrison hasn't turned his head and is just, like, still directly staring at you. Um, I imagine that takes him an immense amount of energy to take these movements. Like, I, he seems yeah. so deliberate. Like, why waste time turning your head? Uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> no one has lived in that building in a very, very long time. Well, that bodes well for me, I suppose. Hmm. He doesn't say anything when he's in. Or does it? He doesn't say anything when you say that either. <laughs> 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 well, Morrison, as always, you've been incredibly useful. Um, and as you say that, you hear more commotion happening at the bar this time. Uh, you hear someone else get involved. And it happens very quickly, where you hear a voice, a deep voice, uh, sounding like maybe one of the workers at the table has gotten up and went and approached the person who is looks like they're about to throw up on the bar. Um, and you can hear that they like move closer to them, and you're hearing this all like behind you, um, but you're kind of putting together the pieces. Um, and he puts his hand on this person's shoulder, and then you hear. A scream in pain as he yells out, This bastard bit me! Oh no. <laughs> um. Uh. Wh why? Does it. Okay, well, I think I've extracted all the information that I can out of Morrison. Um, suddenly I'm like slightly more interested. What? I'm okay. just gonna look again. What's uh, yeah, you look over now, you see, here? like, this, the, the guy who's, like, holding his arm, and it's a pretty deep bite, um, and you watch this in real time as you turn, looking over your shoulder, away from Morrison, and you're now looking at the bar, you see this person holding his arm who was just bent, and you see this sickly person who was there, leaning against the bar, um, you see them begin to convulse and shake, and then something very horrific happens that you weren't expecting. At first, you thought maybe, you know, bar fight. Um, but you watch as this person's chest, chest erupts open, spilling guts and blood everywhere as you watch as three tentacles emerge from it, grab the bartender and grab the person next to them, and start, like, strangling them and pulling them towards him as this person releases a feral scream out into the air. What do you do? Uh, I look back at Morrison and Morrison's I say... Morrison's not there anymore. He what? And then I just say what I was going to say anyway, which is, I, I guess that's my cue. And I'm going to get up from the table and I'm just going to leave. <laughs> You're just going to run fast? Okay. So are they blocking the, the first... door? Uh, they are. So you're in the, like the corner. Uh, this is the bar there, and like you will definitely have to get pat. Like there, this commotion is happening. Uh, you see, like these, like this group of workers is now like trying to like peel these tentacles off this person as they're yelling for help. One person runs out the door. Um, like you're definitely going to have to. This tavern isn't big enough that you can just like shuffle like with a holding a beer like along the outskirts and not get past this. Like you can definitely try to run past this or sneak past this for sure. Um, but this is definitely, like, a big threat right here. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. I might not be able to weasel around here all super sneakily, but is this a place that, like, maybe as soon as the door opened, a, a cat could have easily snuck around through here and weaseled its way through the door as the man left? Uh, yeah, if that's something you wanted to try to do is wild shape. Yeah, so, like, as soon as I see that, uh... Morrison's gone, and I turn back and see that this guy's leaving. Like, as soon as I see him going for the door, I'm gonna stand up from my chair and, like, anamorphopolize myself into a tiny, all-black house cat. Just, okay. like, uh, Salem from Hocus Pocus. Like, that nice, sheeny Absolutely. black. Great reference. Yeah. Um, perfect. Okay, so, uh, we're playing D&D. Let's do a roll. So, I'm going to say let's see like we'll say because you're on the far end this person's going out uh you wild shape which first of all i want to know what it looks like when you wild shape okay uh so yeah as i stand up from the table it's just uh it's 
it's almost unnoticeable. Like I feel like if someone was looking at Cyril when he did it, he would it would just like be a man, and then okay. suddenly there'd be a cat walking across the ground. Okay. I, uh, so his skin will all reshape and turn into fur, but his duster will kind of like take over his body. Okay. Like, like over his head and fall yeah. to the ground. His duster will be like the last thing to They're fall. They're kind of like zoop and into the like, form. Yeah, so like as the yeah. duster falls down on top of his new form, like a cat will run out, but the duster will like become his nice black uh, fur. Okay, perfect. So like most of his transformation is shrouded by the duster. Awesome, I like it. Yeah, so you do this, you quickly wild shape on realizing the Morrison's not there anymore. You see this commotion, this very like disturbing, aberrant scene happening in front of you as this creature's t burst with tentacles is uh, fighting this group of uh, people now. Um, I'm going to have you make an acrobatics check. Uh, this is going to be a DC 10. DC 10, you're able to transform quickly, make it through this area and dart out the door uh, without anything happens happening. If you fail this check, uh, you're going to be stuck in here and you're going to have to figure a way to open that door as a cat i failed my role so you got a nine up. so this is what <laughs> happens uh you like everything's happening uh very like within seconds this is a very chaotic scene going on um almost like in a horror film when like things go bad like it goes bad really bad you turn into a cat you wild shape you try to rush after this person but we'll say this door is like a little bit old instead of like swinging open close it slams shut right in front of your face at this point, you turn around, and you now see that one of the other workers has fallen, the one who got bit, and you see them beginning to con convulse on the ground, and you watch as three tentacles rip out of their chest. Oh, no. What I'm do you a do? cat. I'm smart. Um, I, I have, like, keen smell. Okay. And stuff. Can I use my enhanced senses to try to seek another way out of here yeah do you want to kind of like um are you trying to like maybe see if they have like a kitchen or something where you can sneak out the back door any other open door a kitchen an open window um if there's like a laundry chute <laughs> in the um, bar <laughs> okay so we're gonna keep it dc 10 you're a cat you're not the number one um thing that they're going after right now uh, you see that like slowly as things are falling they're changed transforming into whatever these creatures are um so dc 10 perception check let's see let's see oh no oh i guess i'm rolling with my stats though if that changes uh yeah use the cat stats yeah use the cats and you have advantage on this roll so it's a uh d20 plus eight. that was an eight by the way everyone first roll was a nine though <laughs> Oh, it, I guess it doesn't. It's, it is plus three, so that's that'll be helpful. Okay. T twenty plus three. That time I rolled a seventeen. Ooh, seventeen. Oh, okay, rolled. so door closes in front of you. Things are happening behind you. Very bad things. Uh, you smell um, into oh, nat twenty. Okay, I should have stuck <laughs> and waited for the second roll. So uh, with an advantage, you got a nat twenty, so twenty three. Uh, but I'm honoring that nat twenty. So um, you immediately. Okay, we'll, we'll make this easy. Um, door closes. Bad things happening to you. You quickly uh, begin smelling things. Uh, you notice that um, there is a very strong scent of the seawater um, coming from behind the bar as there is actually a hole in the wall leading to an alleyway um, that probably should have been patched up a long time ago. It's probably like 30 health code violations in this tavern. Um, <laughs> but you're able to dart through it and make it Make your way in, out into the roads uh, and in the alley of uh, Gravenroy, this sm smaller uh, island on the lower city. Um, and as you make your way out into the streets, um, you notice, um, to a surprise to no one, that this isn't an isolated event happening only in the tavern, as the screaming you heard before you went in, went into has now... It's now taking place in multiple places around the city as it seems like something has come to invade this island. Um, you hear people screaming in the distance. You see people running down the streets. 
Uh, you're a cat, so you're doing pretty good right now. These creatures aren't chasing after you. You're doing all right. Uh, I'll say you see from out that from the alleyway out into the main road. You see like three people running, and then you see this uh, creature, uh, a little bit different than the tentacle monster. Um, it has purple skin and scales. It looks like it's the same thing going on, except this one doesn't have tentacles erupting um, out of its chest. But you do see that it has like this long tongue, uh, almost kind of like like long enough that it's going against the ground floor. And you watch as it spits out its tongue and like goes and grabs someone by the ankle and pulls them towards them. Uh, what are you doing? Okay, so I dash out of the bar like a cat speed runs. Yep. Out of the hole, and like as soon as I'm out of the safety of, or the danger of the bar, even though there's a bunch of stuff going on, I'm doing that like cocky cat walk. <laughs> okay, yeah, absolutely. You know, like high footed a little bit. Yeah. Like, well, I'm a, I mean, it sucks to be a person right now. Thank goodness I'm not one of those. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then, unfortunately for the innocent people of Gravenroy, who I ideally would be able to lend a hand to, this seems a bit out of my scope and also very disconnected from my goals so i'm gonna yep. find some like barrels or crates or hay bales or something that could create me a path up to the rooftops yeah and um, i'm just gonna do the nice pretty cat jump up, up to the yeah you're a cat um, i'm not gonna make you roll anything we'll say you easily do that you're able to a lot of uh, the lower city is a lot of um very thrown together building so there's definitely some overlappings it's not like straight walls and straight ceilings so you're able to uh, almost like assassin creed yourself like jumping off different things and you get you on top of um the roof of one of these buildings and most of these buildings are only one um story there's like a couple that are a little bit higher but um like i said these are all kind of thrown together with whatever materials they have so really building over a story two stories gets really risky um sure all right, so you know that the manor in which Morrison told you, Linville Manor, is to the south of the island, and you also know that it is probably, like, five blocks away. Okay, so... When I look down at the streets, like, how rough is five blocks sounding right now if I'm on foot down there? Like, is it, is it like, an impossible task? Because I'm thinking I might just rooftop my way there through, like... Open windows, cracks in the walls, gutters. Um, okay, we're gonna do a perception check. Well, I'll say, uh, roll a perception check for me right now. We're gonna say this is gonna be another DC 10. Um, we're gonna really, to see, like, what you think. Like, what, using your investigator mind. Um, boom. 22, okay. So, you look, uh, out, you see the streets, you see your rooftops. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, both are very very risky like you are going to have to make some pretty um rough jumps but you are noticing in the streets like you are watching as these creatures take down more people that they're also being turned into these creatures so you you would probably guess that like falling might suck but it's not going to suck as much as being transformed into one of these creatures mm. mm-hmm okay well, it seems as though the decision has been made for me <laughs> by the, the horde of monsters in the streets. So yes. I'm going to... You compare it to Assassin's Creed, and that's, like, almost perfect, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Like, going across rooftops and, like, jumping through any random houses that have open windows and, like, going through one open window and out another open window. Yeah. If I have to, like, jump and fall onto an awning and cat bounce onto another thing anything it takes um just to slyly navigate my way around and look as amazing as i can awesome uh yes and just to add a little bit more danger to this scene as you decide this it begins to downpour as the uh -oh. storm has uh made its way here to the slower island you hear the waves from the deep crashing into um the sea walls uh you, the rain is pouring down um there's like a competition between the screams and the thunder as they're both erupting um and you know what? Let's let's make this a little interesting. Let's do um, a skill challenge here. So anyone who doesn't know what a skill challenge is, it is something from older editions of D&D. It is uh, pretty much uh, Shane's character, Cyril. Cyril has to get from one place to another. So uh, I'm going to say you pass three checks. You make it there. Here's how we're going to do this. We'll do five checks all together. 
If you get three successes, you make it there without getting having any problems. Like, you make it across the rooftops. Um, two successes, you're going to be pretty fine. Maybe something happens. One success, um, you're going to probably run into some problems. Uh, if you somehow fail all five of them, <laughs> things are going to look very bad. So... Hey. You are standing on this roof, you see um, where you have to go, and we will say this roof uh, is slanted a little bit. Um, it's a tin roof, rain is falling, you can hear like the sound of like the rain against the tin. Um, and it's beginning to get a little slippery, so... Because it is a skill challenge, I'm going to let you decide what skills you want to use here, or spells, or anything. Um, you have to get across this very, very slanted tin roof. Um, even as a cat, you don't really have anything to grasp onto. What are you going to try to do to get across this, this, uh, this roof? Uh, okay. So, being the hyper-intelligent detective that I am, I'm going to try to, instead of trying to deal with the slippery, slanted tin roof, Okay. if there's some gutters... I'll, like, let the tin roof take me down a little bit to the gutters and try to just balance walk on the gutters instead of it. Like, okay. That sounds like uh, acrobatics. Is that what you're trying okay. to do? Sure, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so we'll say that is a DC 12. A little bit uh, harder than normal. Ha! Okay. I, I critically failed, everybody. Yep, that is a nat one. <laughs> so, um... I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna die. Um, luckily, I don't run Nat ones as the worst thing possible, but that is still a two. Um, is that with your? Oh, it's a Nat one anyway. It's gonna be bad. Um, all right. So you begin running across this tin, and you're like, okay, perfect. I'm gonna just slide down, um, do this cool catwalk. I guess that's a literally um, across this gutter, and then you do that, and as you hit the gutter, um, you immediately remember you're in the lower city of Gravenroy. These gutters are poorly constructed, and your weight breaks them and you fall to the ground um that is i'm gonna count that as two failures because it is a nat one okay so sounds good so two failures um so you're gonna need to pass these next three ones we'll, we'll keep it spicy here everyone um you are now on the ground um and we will say you this commotion as the gutter falls and you fall into the street um garners the attention of one of these aberrant creatures, uh, you see it with its, uh, we'll say it's one of the tentacle monsters, so this once human, uh, you can see its rib cage uh, opened, uh, these tentacles popping out, you see its eyes sunken in, uh, its skin turning, beginning to turn purple, um, its teeth incredibly sharp, and it looks over at you, and you get this feeling that it is looking at its next meal in you. Me? Oh, what are you going to do? M -m Me? <laughs> yes. You, you. Um, well, perhaps I can keep it extra spicy as well. Do it. I'd like to try out our memory mechanic, I think. Okay, cool. So, um, for those, I guess I would say for those who don't know, but I've not even introduced this mechanic yet, so no one knows. Um, so, uh, in this, uh, one shot, we're doing things a little bit different, um, so in 5th edition, uh, there is inspiration, which someone can use to give themselves advantage. Uh, I took that and mixed it with the Blade in the Darks, the Powered by Apocalypse, uh, and the Powered by Apocalypse engine game, uh, in which they have a way to flash back to either give themselves um, items they need or to give themselves um, like better positioning and stuff. Well, we're combining inspiration and that for this because it's one person D&D, &D, so it's already going to be a little rough. Um, so. Cyril has the ability to look back into his memories to either give himself advantage on the next rolls, give himself an item, or to reduce damage. Um, if Cyril chooses to do this, uh, so Shane will have to narrate the memory, which is going to help him here. So, uh, what memory are you pulling from? So we're on, like, the south side area near the sea. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't... I haven't haven't been home that long, but things have been going on, and Cyril's been spending an unusual amount of time in his wild shape forms. Um, it's almost as if he has some sort of 
addictive personality trait or something that makes him want to spend more time in a, in a more feral state doing things like that. So he's found himself being a cat and finding sneaky paths and doing things a little more uh, underground-ish, looking for secret passages like that only a cat would fit through if they were chasing a rat. Oh. And using, trying to use it to his advantage in the city. He's been home for not too long. He's not trying to draw everybody's eye. He doesn't want everybody to be like, "Oh, Cyril's back. I need him to investigate." So he's right. been trying to like keenly navigate around. Um, on top of that, he has keen minds, so he's gonna attempt to use that in in this memory to just exactly remember the sneakiest path that he has taken in okay. this area that he can quickly get into in this Absolutely. moment. Absolutely. So, what uh, skill would you like to use here? Oh, I was going to say stealth, but I don't think that's a good idea. I think I'd like to try to remember it and, like, perceive it in my reality. Okay, so you want to use perception. Please. Okay, yep, go uh, for it. Uh, we'll say this is going to be a DC 10 because you've done this before. Uh, advantage, uh, DC 10. Oh, my <laughs> I critically failed everyone again, and well, I got an advantage. Six. You got a two, so you got a six altogether. Oh, wow! This is a. Uh... I'm gonna die. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's. I've only killed a couple of your characters. <laughs> Statistically, I think it's a positive. <laughs> oh, your character's more. Okay. Um. So this is what's going on. It is raining. Very, very hardly. You go, you turn a corner, and you like, no, you're like, okay, I can like dive through this uh, almost like sewer entrance and make it through uh, diving through this. Um, and mm -hmm. you go there, and you notice like with all the storms recently and the like rain coming down right now that it is completely flooded. Um, you have a choice now, and that is, oh boy, that is uh, that is three failures. <laughs> um, you have the choice. Either turn around, try to pass this uh, aberrant being that is now chasing after you, this tentacle monster, or you can try to dive and swim through this area.